All right, well, once again, it's great to see all of you. And uh, we continue our journey through the magician's nephew in this virtual neighborhood. And if you remember, um, we have one more book after this. So we're going to still find a way, even if we're in the midst of school, we might have to change schedule a little bit, or I might just do like a burst of several ones just to make sure that we'll be able to get through the whole Chronicles of Narnia. Um, it's been a powerful journey so far. Um, if you just think of going back all the way to March um, and all the different adventures that we've gone on in this, uh, this is the hundredth episode right now. So we've been doing this a um, hundred times, a hundred days, uh, having these different adventures. So it's been a blessing um, and a joy to be able to do this. So let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, the feast day of St. Clair. Um, we ask that we might be given that light, uh, just as she had, in being able to see who she was in the light of Christ. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Clair, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, a great thing that St. Clair... Um, she was a friend of uh, St. Francis of Assisi, and she founded a, a group of sisters called the Poor Clares. Um, but one of the things that she says that's really kind of cool is that Jesus is our mirror. And if we want to know who we are, we need to look at Jesus, and he's going to show us more and more who we're called to be. And so the more that we start looking like that reflection in the mirror, the more that we start looking at Jesus we start having his heart, his mind, his hands, all those different things. So something to think about there. So we are now in the midst of chapter eight, the fight at the lamppost. I'm gonna start a little, a couple sentences in the previous chapter to kind of help us remember where, where we've been. Um, remember how we have this, this horrible witch this queen of Charn, the Empress Jadis. Um, somehow uh, she has caught on to Diggory and Polly, the two main characters in our story. And um, now she has been sucked out of her world into this world of London, of England, and she's trying to take it over. So there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on right now. Um, uh, this uh, queen is riding a fire truck so just it, it's very strange like she's riding a fire truck that's driven by horses and uncle andrew is in there as well if you remember the the crazy magician that's why it's called the magician's nephew um diggory is the nephew um and so he's become uncle andrew's become the the slave of this queen um and she's racing over she crashes this fire engine um she jumps off onto the horse, and so she's ready to battle all these different people that are coming after her saying, hey, like, she stole all my jewelry, she stole my horse, she stole all these different things. So that's where we are right now. So I'm just going to start a little earlier here where there's this policeman, actually there's several policemen, and they're sort of like, what is going on here, and who is this crazy person up there? Um, they think that she's just crazy or drunk or something like that because she even tries using that deplorable word that 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 word that can just turn everything lifeless and turn it into dust but it doesn't work in our world so it only sounds like she's just making very strange strange noises and people are like this person's crazy so it's a very very strange episode um and this is what the cabbie so there's a horse named strawberry that's the horse that um uh this witch has taken as her own horse right now and has, you know, made it like spoke into its ears to make it mad and angry and crazy. Um, and so now the cabbie who owns that horse is coming over saying, you know, steady strawberry old boy, steady, and trying to get the witch to just get off the horse and go home, rest, because she's obviously had a little um, too much of a crazy day. So that's where we left off. Then the witch, for the first time in the midst of all this craziness, spoke and said this. Dog! Came her cold, clear voice, ringing loud above all the other noises. Dog, unhand our royal charger. 
We are the Empress Jadis. And now we're on chapter eight, the fight at the lamppost. Oh, Empress, are you? We'll see about that, said a voice. And then another voice said, Three chairs for the Empress of Cloudy Arch. And quite a number joined in. A flush of color came into the witch's face, and she bowed ever so slightly. But the cheers died away into roars of laughter, and she saw that they had only been making fun of her. A change came over her expression, and she changed the knife to her left hand. Then without warning, she did a, dread a thing that was dreadful to see. Lightly, easily, as if it were the most ordinary thing in the world, she stretched up her right arm and wrenched off one of the crossbars of the lamppost. The lampposts are made out of steel. She just took it off. If she had lost some of her magical powers in our world, she had not lost her strength. She could break an iron bar as if it were a stick of barley sugar. She tossed her new weapon up in the air, caught it again, brandished it, and urged the horse forward. That is a scary lady. Now's my chance, thought Diggory. He darted between the horse and the railings and began going forward. Remember, he's trying to take his rings and be able to touch um, the, the Queen Jadis because then that would make her go out of that world into that wood, that world, that wood between the worlds. So that's what he's kind of thinking right now with his rings. If only the brute would stay still for a moment, he might catch the witch's heel. As he rushed, he heard the sickening crash and a thud. The witch had brought down the bar on the chief policeman's helmet. The man fell like a ninepin. Quick, Diggory, this must be stopped, said a voice behind him. It was Polly who had rushed down the moment she was allowed out of bed. You are a brick, said Diggory. Hold on to me tight. You'll have to manage the ring. Yellow, remember, and don't put it on till I shout. There was a second crash, and another policeman crumpled up. Then came an angry roar from the crowd. Pull it down! Get a few paving stones! Call out the military! But most of them were getting as far away as they could. The cabbie, however, obviously the bravest as well as the kindest person present, was keeping close to the horse, dodging this way and that to avoid the bar, but still trying to catch Strawberry's head. The crowd booed and bellowed again. A stone whistled over Diggory's head. Then came a voice, the voice of the witch, clear as a great bell, and sounded as if for once she were almost happy. Scum, you shall pay dearly for this when I have conquered your world. Not one stone of your city will be left. I will make it as Chan, as Felinda, as Sorlois. And as Brahmadine, Diggory at last caught her ankle. She kicked back with her heel and hit him in the mouth. In his pain, he lost hold. His lip was caught in his mouth full of blood. From somewhere very close came the voice of Uncle Andrew in a sort of trembling scream. Madam, my dear young lady, for heaven's sake, compose yourself. Diggory made a second grab at her heel and was again shaken off. More men were knocked down by the iron bar. He made a third grab, caught the heel, held on like grim death, shouting to Polly, Go! And then, oh thank goodness, the angry and frightened faces had vanished. The angry, frightened voices were silenced, all except Uncle Andrew's. Close beside Diggory in the darkness, it was wailing on, Oh, oh, is this delirium? Is this the end? I can't bear it. It's not fair. I never meant to be a magician. It's all a misunderstanding. It's all my god, my godmother's fault. I must protest against this. In my state of health, too. A very old Dorchester family. Bother, thought Diggory. We didn't want to bring him along. My hat, what a picnic. Are you there, Polly? Yes, I'm here. Don't keep on shoving. I'm not, began Diggory, but before he could say anything more, their heads came into the warm green sunshine of the wood. And as they stepped out of the pool, Polly cried out. Oh, look, we've brought the old horse with us, too. And Mr. Cattley. And the cabbie. This is a pretty kettle of fish. 
And as soon as the witch saw that she was once more in the wood, she turned pale and bent down till her face touched the mane of the horse. You could see she felt deadly sick. Uncle Andrew was shivering, but Strawberry the horse shook his head, gave a cheerful whinny, and seemed to feel better. He became quiet for the first time since Diggory had seen him. His ears, which had been laid flat back against on his skull, came to their proper position, and the fire went out of his eyes. That's right, old boy, said the cabbie, slapping Strawberry's neck. That's better. Take it easy. Strawberry did the most natural thing in the world. Being very thirsty, and no wonder, he walked, he walked slowly across to the nearest pool and stepped into it to have a drink. Diggory was still holding the witch's heel, and Polly was holding Diggory's hand. One of the cabbies was on Strawberry, and Uncle Andrew, still very shaky, had just grabbed on to the cabbie's other hand. Quick, said Polly with a look at Diggory, greens! So the horse never got his drink. Instead, the whole party found themselves sinking into darkness. Strawberry neighed. Uncle Andrew whimpered. Diggory said, that was a bit of luck. But there was a short pause. Then Polly said, oughtn't we... Well, oughtn't we to be nearly there now? We do seem to be somewhere, said Diggory. At least I'm standing on something solid. Why, so am I, now that I come to think of it, said Polly. But why is it so dark? I say, do you think we've got into the wrong pool? Perhaps this is Chan, said Diggory. Only we've got back in the middle of the night. This is not Chan, came the witch's voice. It is an empty world. This is nothing. And really, it was uncommonly like nothing. There were no stars. It was so dark that they couldn't see one another at all, and it made no difference whether you kept your eyes shut or opened. Under their feet there was a cool, flat something which might have been earth, and was certainly not grass or wood, the air was cold and dry, and there was no wind. My doom has come upon me, said the witch in a voice of horrible calmness. Oh, don't say that, babbled Uncle Andrew. My dear young lady, pray don't say such things. It can't be as bad as that. Ah, cat man, my good man, why... You don't happen to have a flask about you? A drop of spirits is just what I need. Now then, now then, came the cabbie's voice in a good, firm, hearty voice. Keep cool, everyone. That's what I say. No bones broken, anyone. Good. Well, there's something to be thankful for straight away. And more than anyone could expect after falling all that way. Now, if we've fallen down some diggings, as it might be for a new station on the underground, uh, someone will come and get us out presently, see? And if we're dead, which I, I don't deny it might be, well, you got to remember that worse things happen at sea and a chap's got to die sometime. And there ain't nothing to be afraid of if the chap's led a decent life. And if you ask me... I think the best thing we could do to pass the time would be to sing an hymn. And he did. He struck up at once a harvest thanksgiving hymn. All about the crops being safely gathered in. It was not very suitable to a place which felt as if nothing had ever grown there since the beginning of time, but it was the one he could remember best. He had a fine voice, and the children joined in. It was very cheering. Uncle Andrew and the witch did not join in. Toward the end of the hymn, Diggory felt someone plucking at his elbow, and from a general smell of brandy and cigars and good clothes, he decided that it must be Uncle Andrew. Uncle Andrew was cautiously pulling him away from the others. When they had gone a little distance, the old man put his mouth so close to Diggory's ear that it tickled and whispered, Now, my boy, slip on your ring. Let's be off but the witch had very good ears. Fool, came her voice, and she leaped off the horse. Have you forgotten that I can hear men's thoughts? 
Let go the boy. If you attempt treachery, I will take such vengeance upon you as never was heard of in all the worlds from the beginning. And, added Diggory, if you think I'm such a mean pig as to go off and leave Polly and the cabby and the horse in a place like this, you're well mistaken. You're a very naughty and impertinent little boy, said Uncle Andrew. Hush, said the cabbie, and they all listened. In the darkness, something was happening at last. A voice had begun to sing. It was very far away, and Diggory found it hard to decide from what direction it was coming. Sometimes it seemed to come from all directions at once. Sometimes he thought it was coming out of the earth beneath them. Its lower notes were deep enough to be the voice of the earth herself. But there were no words. There was hardly even a tune. But it was, beyond comparison, the most beautiful noise he had ever heard. It was so beautiful he could hardly bear it. The horse seemed to like it too. He gave a sort of whinny a horse would give if... After years of being a cab horse, it found itself back in the old field where it had played as a foal, and saw someone whom it remembered and loved coming across the field to bring in a lump of sugar. God, said the cabby, ain't it lovely? Then two wonders happened at the same moment. One was that the voice was suddenly joined by other voices more voices than you could possibly count. They were in harmony with it. But higher up the scale, cold, tingling, silvery voices. A second wonder was that the blackness overhead all at once was blazing with stars. They didn't come out gently one by one as they do on a summer evening. One moment they had been there had been nothing but darkness. The next moment a thousand, thousand points of light leaped out, Single stars, constellations, and planets brighter and bigger than any in our world. There were no clouds. The new stars and the new voices began at exactly the same time. If you had seen and heard it as Diggory did, you would have felt quite certain that it was the stars themselves who were singing, and that it was the first voice, the deep one, which had made them appear and made them sing. Glory be, said the cabbie. I'd have been a better man all my life if I'd known that there were things like this. The voice on the earth was now louder and more triumphant. But the voices in the sky, after singing loudly with it for, the, for a time, began to get fainter. And now something else was happening. Far away. Down the near, down near the horizon, the sky began to turn gray. A light wind, very fresh, began to stir. The sky in that one place grew slowly and steadily paler. You could see shapes of hills standing up dark against it. All the time, the voice went on singing. There was soon light enough for them to see one another's faces. The cabbie and the two children had open mouths and shining eyes. They were drinking in the sound. They looked as if it reminded them of something. Uncle Andrew's mouth was open too, but not open with joy. He looked more as if his chin had simply dropped away from the rest of his face. His shoulders were stooped and his knees shook. He was not liking the voice. If he could have got away from it by creeping into a rat's hole, he would have done so. But the witch looked as if, in a way, she understood the music better than any of them. Her mouth was shut, her lips were pressed together, and her fists were clenched. Ever since the song began, she had felt that this world was filled with a magic different from hers and stronger. She hated it. She would have smashed that whole world or all worlds to pieces if it would only stop the singing. The horse stood with its ears well forward and, trip and twitching. Every now and then it snorted and stamped the ground. It no longer looked like a tired old cab horse. 
you could now well believe that its father had been in battles. The eastern sky changed from white to pink, and from pink to gold. The voice rose and rose, till all the air was shaking with it. And just as it swelled to the mightiest and most glorious sound it had yet produced, the sun arose. Diggory had never seen such a sun. The sun above the ruins of Charn looked older than ours. This looked younger. You could imagine that it laughed for joy as it came up. And as its beams shot across the land, the travelers could see for the first time what sort of place they were in. It was a valley through which a broad, swift river wound its way, flowing eastward toward the sun. Southward there were mountains, northward there were lower hills, but it was a valley of mere earth, rock and water. There was not a tree, not a bush, not a blade of grass to be seen. The earth was of many colors. They were fresh, hot, and vivid. They made you feel excited till you saw the singer himself and then you forgot everything else. It was a lion, huge, shaggy and bright. It stood facing the rising sun. Its mouth was wide open in song, and it was about 300 yards away. This is a terrible world, said the witch. We must fly at once. Prepare the magic. I quite agree with you, ma'am, said Uncle Andrew. A most disagreeable place completely uncivilized, if only I were a younger man and had a gun. Gone, said the, said the cabby. You don't think you could shoot him, do you? And who would, said Polly. Prepare the magic, old fool, said Jadis. Certainly, ma'am, said Uncle Andrew cunningly. I must have both the children touching me. Put on your homeward ring at once, Diggory. He wanted to get away without the witch. Oh, it's rings, is it? cried Jadis. She would have had her hands in Diggory's pocket before you could say knife, but Diggory grabbed Polly and shouted out, Take care. If either of you come half an inch nearer, we two will vanish, and you'll be left here for good. Yes, I have a ring in my pocket that will take Polly and me home. And look, my hand is just ready, so keep your distance. I'm sorry about you, he looked at the cabby, and about the horse, but I can't help that. And as for you two, he looked at Uncle Andrew and the Queen, you're both magicians, so you ought to enjoy living together. Hold your nose, everyone, said the cabby. I want to listen to the mosaic. For the song had now changed. And that is the end of this chapter. So we meet a lion who's singing a song. And the light of the stars comes out, the rising of the sun. There's still no life, there's no trees or anything like that. But all of a sudden, this light is coming and there is this rocky, rocky ground. Jadis that queen recognizes that there's a stronger magic here. There's something more powerful than her, and she hates it. Uncle Andrew doesn't like it, but the others thought that it was the most amazing thing imaginable. The next chapter, one of the most beautiful of chapters of all the Chronicles of Narnia, is called The Founding of Narnia. So until next time, God bless you all. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.